Well, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. And first and foremost, my thanks to uh, Justice Julia Sabatundi and the Institute for the uh, invitation. It's always an honor to come to the Peace Palace. And I think uh, all of us that have the um, real privilege of attending this building, uh, however many times one enters, should never take it for granted. Because it's been said previously, it's a, a temple of justice. It um, represents an awful lot in the international legal order, which brings me, in fact, to uh, the topic of my speech. And as I was contemplating uh, what I would speak upon, and I looked at the agenda and the various um, uh, topics of discussion, uh, I thought I'll be a little bit controversial. It's always, uh, it's always quite nice. Uh, and the topic of, of my uh, short talk today is uh, international conventions. Uh, are they worth the paper they're written on? Uh, when one surveys the landscape of humanity, you see mankind and womankind groaning under pain and suffering. One sees children in abject poverty, denied the opportunity for education. Women still, in this 21st century, fighting for a voice for, to be effectively enfranchised. Conflicts left, right, and center insecurity, economic disparity to the extent that 99% of the world's wealth is owned by 1% of the population. And that's despite the burgeoning number of international conventions and the number of trees cut down every year uh, and instruments that are deposited by the sec uh, at uh, the United Nations with the Secretary General of the United Nations and other regional and institutional uh, conventions, uh, and yet international conventions do matter, because this year, 2015, marks notably the 800th, 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta, for it was in 1215 that a one-page piece of parchment with 63 clauses was endorsed with the seal of King John. And when one looks at that Magna Carta, it contains a lot of irrelevance. Units of wine, how big should they be? Fishing rights. And indeed, only three of those clauses remain effective in the law uh, in England and Wales today. The establishment of the church, uh, the rights of the City of London, uh, and then the principle, the most um, uh, important right uh, regarding due process to no man should we sell delay or deny justice it was with the Magna Carta of 1215 <coughs> that the principle was ingrained in English law that the king is under no man but God and the law uh, and therefore it is always useful to look at contemporary uh, international human rights law, current international humanitarian law. Look at the institutions like the ICC that are up and running today. But sometimes it pays dividends to pause and look back at where we've come from and what these law means. For the Magna Carta has resonated throughout the centuries and it has a force much greater than its 63 clauses. As a peace agreement, it was a failure. It lasted only 12 weeks. But yet that cannot be the test, in my respectful view. Of course, it was not the first international convention, nor was it the first domestic convention that had been put down on paper. Uh, we have uh, the famous Code of Justinian. We have, in antiquity, the very important code of Cyrus the Great. Uh, and if you go to the British Museum and see the cylinder of Cyrus, and there's a, a reproduction very aptly uh, just outside the Security Council building in New York, uh, the room of the Security Council, uh, you see there uh, 600 years before Jesus Christ uh, a, a, a document which uh, encapsulates uh, the rights of religion to rebuild temples, uh, the right that slaves should be returned, 
uh, and the right of individuals to live uh, free from racial, linguistic, and religious discrimination. Uh, similarly, the canon law, the law of the Talmud, the law of the Torah, uh, is not to be disregarded when one is looking at international conventions and how the law has progressed from antiquity. Uh, and indeed, particularly today, with the current contorted face of Islam in the face of ISIS, who twist, contort, manipulate a peaceful religion into a hideous creature, it is useful to bear in mind the sec second chapter of the Holy Quran, La Ikraha Fiddin, that there is no compulsion in the matter of religion, or Surah Al Hajj, that Muslims are enjoined to protect in this order churches and synagogues and temples and mosques. Or one could look at the covenant of St. Catherine, in which the Prophet of Islam said that all uh, Christians, and I'll read it in fact, no compulsion is on them, neither are their judges to be removed from their jobs nor their monks from their monasteries. No one is to destroy a house of their religion nor to damage it or to carry anything from it to Muslim houses. Should anyone take any of these, he will violate God's covenant and disobey his prophet. Verily they, the Christians, are my allies and have my secure charter against all that they hate. No one is to force them to travel or to oblige them to fight. The Muslims are to fight for them. If a female Christian is married to a Muslim, it is not to take place without her approval. She is not to be prevented from visiting her church to pray. Their churches are to be respected. They are neither to be prevented from repairing them nor the sacredness of their covenants. No one of this nation is to disobey this covenant till the end of the world. Uh, and yet one sees mosques, churches and synagogues are prohibited in so many so-called Muslim countries. And you see uh, a lack of freedom of religion, not just in relation to uh, Christians and Jews, but even between uh, Muslim communities, never mind Shia and Sunnis, uh, the Ahmadiyya <laughs> community and many others. So is the law really not worth the paper it's written on? My thesis is far from it. Because there's always a time in the affairs of men when humanity, for whatever reason, needs to stop, needs to re-familiarize themselves with their bearings. What course are they embarked upon? And at, the, at those moments, the learning of the ages comes to the fore. Whether one calls it a new enlightenment, a renaissance, or touchstones that will help us chart a course to the future. History is littered with those pivotal moments which puts mankind, humankind, back on track. And these conventions play an important role as part of the legacy of civilization of which we are all part. So the Magna Carta, uh, originally uh, in Runnymede, in King John, largely irrelevant, has a resonance that lasts today. And of course, in the progress of civilization in the 1770s in the United States, um, Declaration of Independence in the movement of the French Revolution, uh, the Magna Carta had a great um, uh, inspirational role. Uh, and indeed, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, chairperson of the United Nations Commission of Human Rights, when she drafted uh, and promulgated uh, the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights on the 10th of December, uh, 1948, uh, paid reference to the Magna Carta as to the role that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights should have. And she said in her speech to the General Assembly, and I quote, we stand today at the threshold of a great event both in the life of the United Nations and in the life of mankind. This declaration may well become the Magna Carta for all men everywhere. We hope its proclamation by the General Assembly will be an event comparable with the 
proclamation in 1789, that's the French declaration of course, the adoption of the Bill of Rights by the people of the United States and the adoption of comparable declarations at different times by different nations. Uh, of course, when the Universal Declaration was enacted, people criticized it. Well, it has no force of law. It's a declaration. It's an aspiration. Uh, it's true. And of course, uh, the Bill of Rights that came with the uh, 1966 two international conventions uh, gave some um, detail to the aspiration and the hopes and the ideals that were encapsulated in the Universal Declaration. But many countries stayed away for political reasons. But what we've seen is even those naysayers like China, like the United States, eventually signed up to those 1966 uh, international conventions. And the uh, tapestry of international law that is weaved with the various international conventions and regional agreements that pepper uh, the international legal order uh, serve another purpose, because whilst we are far from a world of equals, uh, the principle in law of sovereign equality is a fiction. In reality, we have a, a charter, a United Nations Charter, in the Security Council where some are more equal than others. We have veto powers. When it comes to the ICC, we have three permanent members that will uh, uh, be able to refer third states, and yet will never be subject to the jurisdiction of the court unless they uh, sign up. So what is the point of all of this, of all these conventions? The reality is international law is an idea. And history has shown us that an idea is more powerful than governments, than boundaries, uh, than uh, a dogma. And these ideas, these standards, these expectations of rights become part of the lexicon, not only of academics in the ivory towers or learned jurists in palaces of justice, but they become the lexicon of normal, everyday people, those that are most in need of the protection of the law. And the conduct of nations, the conduct of states, and the conduct of the powerful are rendered ever starker against a standard that these international law agreements represent. And whether or not states or individuals sign up, ratify, or agree to be bound by those international agreements, the reality is, even then, they have an effect. And that can only be to better the progress of humanity. Thank you very much.